What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Puzzle Huddle with Experts. I have a fantastic guest, Dr. Megan Brown. Uh, she has a doctoral degree in education, uh, a lifetime career in education, uh, very insightful, and I, I'm glad to have her here today. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be with you today. All right, Dr. Brown, just to set the foundation for all of us, can you tell us what your kind of your academic uh, credentials are and, 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 and what you're an expert in? Okay, sure will. So um, after graduating from high school, I immediately matriculated into Wayne State University and I have three degrees from Wayne State. And so, yes. So, you got some degrees, <laughs> I'm excited. I oh, have a letter behind my name, I do. I love um, it. I have to say that I love being a student just as much as I love being a teacher. So I am a lifelong learner. Um, so from Wayne State, I have my bachelor's in science in mm -hmm. secondary education. Um, I majored in English, minored in speech, and then I received my master's in administration, K-12 administration, so that allows me to be a principal, uh, and then I received my educational specialist, which is the first 30 credits of your doctoral degree, and that is in K-12 curriculum and instruction. So then I took a break from that Wayne State right. journey and then really focused on my career um, while going to school also for the master's and the specialist. But then I uh, started working at Central Michigan University in their charter school office. And I never even had CMU on my radar until I started working there. Uh, my husband is a CMU graduate, but it worked for him. But for me, I was thinking somewhere other than Wayne State, like, is it possible? I just have so much love for Wayne. Uh, but once I started working for CMU, I saw the opportunities that were there. And so I received my doctorate um, in education mm -hmm. in the educational leadership program. And so that was um, actually a hybrid program where we would go on campus for one one week out of the school year and we would work in our cohorts and then the rest of our classes were done online and we would meet with our cohort every other Saturday for the you know synchronous instruction everything else was primarily asynchronous and so I went through that program for three years all right and then for the for the dissertation part of your degree what is it that you study for your dissertation so I studied a topic called world schooling and um, it is when families choose to homeschool, but they take the experiences of living abroad and they infuse that into their daily instruction. And so I started thinking about world schooling even before I started my doctoral program. So I talked to one of my mentors and she said, think about what your topic is going to be now so that as you're writing papers, you can take tidbits from each yeah. paper. Mm -hmm. And then infuse it into your actual dissertation. And she said, think about what is it that keeps you up at night or what is it that you're extremely passionate about? And so for me, the things that I'm most passionate about, education, mm -hmm. traveling, and most importantly, my own children. And so I had to think, how do I blend those three pieces? And so I started looking up like travel education, education for children learning abroad, and then I found the topic of world schooling. And so with the families who world school, a lot of them document their experiences online. Yeah. And that's how I found the families for my study. I started the Instagram account and I don't even use Instagram for anything <laughs> other than following celebrities and my families who are world schooling. And so I saw their journey online and I said, oh, this is absolutely amazing. Yeah, I follow a couple of those accounts too. And it's, it's really... I'm not sure about the, the world part, but at least in the United States, uh, there's a family that drives an RV uh, and they're all over the map. And it, it seemed to be creating really cool educational experiences for their kids. Mm -hmm. and, and that's ro road schooling. So you have some families oh, cool. road schooling. So who stay in their specific you know, continent or country and then they explore the different regions. Um, but for world schooling, families choose to travel internationally. And so the name of my study itself or the title was Parental decision making and individualized instruction, a multiple case study of world schooling. So I connected with three families who vary in range and experiences of world schooling. One family had only been world schooling for two years, whereas another one had been world schooling for 15 years 
And this is the only style of education that their children have been exposed to. And each family chose to do it for a different reason. So one family wanted to connect to their own personal roots as an Asian American family. They wanted to travel to Asia to see where did our family come from? Yeah. And so they went to Vietnam, they went to the Philippines, they connected to family members that they hadn't met before. Um, and so that was a part of their journey. I had another journey uh, for a family who was African-American and Latina, and they wanted their children to not feel this sense of othering that they felt in the United States. They didn't want their kids to feel like second-class citizens. And so they wanted to see where can we be valued and appreciated as a Black family living abroad. And so their experiences in Thailand and in Portugal they saw the world differently and they wanted their children to see that their own gifts and talents in culinary arts and in digital media, how that can translate to any community. And then my third family, um, they are a Caucasian family with an adopted African-American daughter. And they have several children in their family. And so they wanted to see what is it like being a blended family, a multiracial family in another country? And what are the experiences that our children can really learn from as far as culture, language, geography? And so they completely immerse themselves in the culture of any community that they live in, and they choose to slow travel. So they'll live there for three to six months and really become a part of the community. So it's not just tourism for them, it is really a lifestyle. This is going to spark the interest of a lot of people watching this. Is that a hashtag that can be followed on social media? Is, is world schooling? World schooling, yes. It is a hashtag that can be followed. World schooling or just world school, either one, you can definitely follow it. And that's how I found all of my families. I reached out to almost 30, 40 families when I first started. So there is um, a huge network of families who are out there. And then when I started the study itself, I focused just on three families primarily. All right. And so after, as I'm thinking about homeschooling and now world schooling, that there's not, I'm not sure that there's a rich tradition of that in the African-American community, community. So are we finding that more families are interested in that now or what, how, how do you get there if that isn't something that you've seen your parents do or grandparents or aunts and uncles, if there's no exposure to it in your kind of lived experience, how do you make a decision that, I mean, can be perceived as pretty extreme if so you're not connected to that? And great question, because more families of color are starting to migrate to homeschooling. Um, yeah. You have more African-American families, you have more uh, Latino families. And what we're noticing in the research is that families are moving towards it because they want more cultural identity for their children. Mm -hmm. They don't want them to receive just the traditional textbook history that they get in K-12. They really want them to research more about their own history, their own lineage. What does it mean to be Black in America? What does it mean to be Latina in America? And so a lot of the families are now starting to transition to that, but they are building networks. And so there are homeschool networks in a lot of the metropolitan areas because you have individuals who need someone else to, to connect with. Um, the other way that families can connect, there are world schooling and homeschooling conferences that they can attend. And since COVID, a lot of that has moved online. Yeah. And so you have much more resources that are available now than you know three or four years ago. All right, and maybe I'm going to try to jump back to your childhood and bring my bring our conversation back to where we are currently. For a person to be so uh, inspired to, to pursue education and formally, this is not just read a book, this is like pursue degrees in higher education. What, what, what about, what influenced you that you had such a fond relationship with education and, 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 and school? So it was a couple of things. Um, one, I come from a line of educators. And so my grandmother was an educated uh, educator in the segregated South. She uh, taught in a one room schoolhouse in Carthage, Mississippi. And uh, once she moved north with my grandfather, she was still heavily involved in the school system with her children. Uh, I have a maternal and paternal aunt who are educators. And uh, both of my sisters are also educators. And so there was a time where all three of us were in graduate school together. And so we just love education. My oldest sister is a phenomenal special education teacher. 
Um, my middle sister, yes, my middle sister is a high school guidance counselor, and she was also a SPED teacher. And I'm the only one that didn't do SPED. <laughs> I'm scared of report card season at your house. Like when these kids got to pull their course and all their aunties. <laughs> everyone and so trust me if there is a grade that we are not pleased with you don't just hear it from your mother oh, you, you don't hear get it, it from your aunts as well so our six little humans are what we call our grandchildren in our family they all know you have to come correct when it is a report card time so yeah don't talk about you didn't learn your division not with your aunts <laughs> no 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 you have at home tutoring whenever you want it just pick one of the three of us and and we can tutor Okay, and then, and then for your the your PhD topic, what, what was there was there evidence of that at all in your childhood? This world schooling thing is that something that you just got interested in during the dissertation process, or or have you had a lifelong interest in that? I've had a lifelong interest in it. Um, as a child, I was really involved with the arts. Um, I was fortunate enough that when I was in elementary schools, so I transitioned schools from um, between third grade and fourth grade. The fourth grade school that I went to, and I was there from fourth until eighth, um, Faith Christian Academy, and it was a very rigorous school. I had not experienced education like this before. We were learning at uh, two grades above grade level. There was homework for hours every night, um, but the school had a motto of excellence or nothing at all. And it doesn't mean you have to be perfect in everything that you do, but whatever you are presenting, you have to present it at a level of what is your personal excellence. And so that truly molded who I was as a student. And so while I was there, I was uh, handed my first instruments. I had a wonderful music teacher there, Willie McAllister. Um, several people in the Detroit community uh, really know and respect the work that he's done. But he allowed us to try different instruments and which one was the one that fit us. So I started playing flute in the fourth grade. And from then, I attended fine arts camp. So he encouraged all of us to kind of stretch ourselves a little bit more and to see what other artists were out there. Um, it was in a good, healthy competition for us. Um, and I will admit, other than middle school, I was never first chair again. <laughs> <laughs> but it embedded something in me for, you know, the love of the arts. So while I was at Blue Lake, um, I, went, I was there for flute, but I was singing in the shower. And when I got out of the shower, my cabin mates were standing around and it was like the creepiest thing. I said, what are you all doing? They said, we heard you sing in the shower. You should audition for the choir. And I was like, no, I don't think I'm going to do that. I don't know how to sing sheet music. And they said, just try it. So I went ahead, I auditioned, came back from camp, continued my summer. And we got a letter a few weeks later. And my parents said, you auditioned for the choir? I said, yeah, I did. They said, well, looks like you'll be going to Europe next summer. And so it was the international choir for Blue Lake. And so, wow. yeah. And so I spent my freshman year of high school um, studying sheet music. And mm -hmm. so I was in women's vocal. And then that taught me what I needed to know to prepare myself for that intensive summer. And then the summer between uh, ninth and 10th grade, I traveled to Europe and I was there for three weeks. And I lived with host families in Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Belgium, Switzerland, France. So that really opened my eyes to what is available outside of your community. Now, I grew up in a wonderful neighborhood, very supportive environment, but to see the world in a, yeah. another country and to see that as a 15-year-old, that's what really sparked for me that there are other communities and other lives and other languages just eight hours away on a plane ride. And so as a parent, you know, my husband and I had children, it was important for us to expose our children to that as well. And so that really served as like the catalyst for wanting to do the research around world schooling. Uh, do, do your kids sing or is that something that has yet to reveal itself yet? My children sing, they do. And so it's funny, everyone in our family sings. It's almost as if you're just kind of born into knowing how to harmonize. Um, going back to my grandmother, when we would travel to Mississippi on our family vacations, it'd be my grandmother, my mom and my aunt, and then the grandkids, and we would, you know, drive down together, and our family would sing the entire time down 75 to get to Mississippi, and then we would wow. get there to see my awesome. grandmother and my great aunts and uncles, and they didn't have instruments, but you would pat your feet, 
and one sibling would give the key and then everyone else would just start singing. And so it was just something that was embedded in us. And so our children picked up on that as well. So what were you guys thinking? Were you singing gospel? Is this Whitney Houston or what, what kind of what kind of song? It was it? gospel. It was just backwoods hymns that you can only hear in a little church in Mississippi. And so, um, and even growing up, we grew up in a traditional Baptist church and it was the same thing of just Sunday morning hymns. And my father was in the middle course, you know, everyone in our family sang in the choir. So the same thing with our children. Um, and, and people joke now that when we go out to restaurants and sing happy birthday, people turn their heads wow. and like, it sounds like a choir over there singing happy birthday. Yeah, but it's that's- just a part of you know who we are as a family. Now I will tell you, don't ask me to sing because I am going to sing with my family. I know where I fit in, my you know first soprano voice. But it's something beautiful about singing, you know, as an ensemble, especially with your family members. Oh yeah, I, I, I bet it feels like it just it, and there's an intangible quality that's just like yeah. something that certainly feels special. Mm-hmm. I wonder because you you seem to have a, a very productive uh, childhood. Did did you, what? Did you give your parents any trouble? Like what 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 might have been something that uh, might have distracted you or wasn't as connected to your you know your, your positive development? What 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 kind of things tripped you up as a child? So, I won't say that I gave my parents trouble. So, I learned from my sisters. And so, I have two older sisters. One is 10 years older than me, the other is 7 years older than me. And um, I noticed what they were doing and what caused the reaction in my parents. So then I knew what not to do. So I definitely learned from experience with the two of them. But one thing that kind of just makes my childhood unique is that I am a surviving premature twin. And so my mother had, yes, see, things you find out in conversations. So my mother had my twin sister and I when she was 26 weeks pregnant. And uh, the doctors had a very grim diagnosis for the both of us. Um, My sister, unfortunately, passed away the day after we were born. She died in my dad's arms. She had a cerebral hemorrhage. And the doctors had said to my parents, like, don't expect much from Megan. They said, you know, she will probably be blind, deaf, have a learning disability, may not even make it out of the NICU. They told them, don't even decorate a nursery because we don't know if she'll make it. Um, well, you should sure beat that. <laughs> you beat I that should, by a lot. Yes, I defied all of the odds. And so I stayed in the NICU for um, almost three months. I was only four pounds when I came home. So at birth, I was two pounds, five ounces, went down to a pound and 14 ounces. So very small, but came home and I was four pounds. They monitor me very closely for the first seven years of life. Mm-hmm. Um, and so now as an adult, I see that every phase of life, I wasn't just accomplishing something for me, it was also for my twin sister. And so she has continued to be my motivation. Um, Even when I wrote my dissertation, there's a portion that is dedicated to her. When I defended my dissertation, uh, I have a picture of her and her newborn picture was next to me. Really? Defended. Yes. And so my family has been very intentional about making her memory and her life, even though it was only for a day, really including her as a part of our family structure. And so I definitely would say that is the piece that I had to overcome. You know, it has been some, you know, survivor's guilt of why did I live and not her, but just understanding that everything happens for a reason. And my parents have always just reminded me that, you know, you were here for a reason and they have seen every step of the way, the reason why. So you, you've mentioned a lot of really cool developmental experiences, your, your family structure with uh, teachers and educators, you know, uh, circling the, the, your, your children. How do you think, and, and your professional expertise, how do you think all this stuff shows up in how you parent? What, 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 how does it influence the type of parent you are? Because certainly you parent a specific way based on all of this academic and professional insight that you have. Absolutely. So I have to say that the fact that I was raised by both of my parents has been instrumental in my life. My parents just celebrated their 55th wedding anniversary. Yes, 55 years. And so they modeled for us what family structure looked like. 
Um, you know, both of them very hardworking. We are a very average middle class family. Um, but my parents made sure we were surrounded with so much love and so much acceptance. We were not perfect children by any scope of means. Um, but however, they allow us to make mistakes and they taught us through those mistakes. Um, and then they never held it against us. It wasn't like a, remember when you did? It was like, no, you know, you learn from it. You knew you shouldn't have done it moving on. So my husband and I are also very intentional in how we raise our children. Uh, we have conversations with them all of the time. And we are very purposeful about not reacting out of anger. And so we don't put our hands on our children. If they do something wrong, we take a minute, we breathe, we talk about it first. Big one. You got to take and a breath. Approach, you got to take a breath because sometimes these kids will try you. I know it. They, they, they're they children. They're not, they're children. They are not robots. You'd be thinking that I should get robotic compliance. That is not what you're going to get. No, no. And I keep telling myself in my educator brain, okay, that frontal cortex is not developed yet. I know they don't have that rational piece yet and they won't have it until their early 20s. And so we try to talk to them as much as possible and explain to them, like, this is the mistake that you made. This is, and explain to us why. We always ask the why behind it so we can just unpack it from their perspective. Um, and then we just make a family decision as to what's going to happen next. And I think because they know that they're in a space where they can make mistakes, but there are two things in the road. Either your actions are going to produce a reward or they're going to produce a repercussion. It's up to you which one you get. And so being very clear in that has, has helped us with the discipline of our children. The other piece is we expose our kids to quite a bit. They are our priority. And when we decided to have children, we said for the next 18 years, they're our number one priority. So all of our time, treasure, and talent goes into them for the next 18 years. So we're very intentional about exposing them to the world outside of our four walls. Oh, they're going to run your bank account. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Them jokers grow so fast. Every pair of shoes, pair of, they got holes and stuff. So... You yeah. Gonna, yeah, they're going to cost, they're go, there's going to be a, an expense uh, that you have to be. They are the reason I work every day, every yeah. day because of them. T t tell me about high school, because I want to, I just want to give a little love to all, all of our, uh, our Cast Tech alumni friends. What, what, what were some of your favorite experiences in high school? Oh, I loved the four years of high school more than I loved the four years of undergrad. It was something special. Yeah, yeah, we had it. Look, it was a good time. I, it I, was. It was. And it was just something special about CT. It, it truly is second to none. Um, and for me, because I had been in private school up until high school, I never knew what public school was like. And so I went in like eyes wide open because my eighth grade class only had 13 people in it. And I have been with those same individuals since fourth grade. Yeah. So transitioning from that to then 3,600 people, it was just like, wow, this is amazing. Um, but it's also easy to get lost in a school of that. Yeah, you, that could happen too. Yeah, yeah. So for me, finding my tribe within the music department mm -hmm. was it. And, and it kept me connected and it kept me focused on academics because I knew that I couldn't perform if I didn't have the grades. And so that was motivation. So for me, and I, I tell my kids all the time, like being in the marching band taught me so much discipline and not, you know, I didn't play my flute in the marching band. I was a flag girl. Um, and sometimes, you know, auxiliary is the scene. It's just like, oh, they're just the ones behind the band. Yeah, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot. And an auxiliary member. And so the, the best memories that I have are connected to being in the marching band and being in harp and vocal and performing with my harp and vocal sisters and just the routine and discipline that comes along with learning sheet music, learning how to perform, how to carry yourself on the stage and on the field. So many of those lessons that I learned during those four years are embedded in me right now. But I have a lot of good memories that, that come along with harp and vocal and, and the marching band. Yeah, it, it'd be hard to rate my high school experiences better than anybody else's, but I, I surely had a good one. Um, oh, yeah. It's not, yeah, there were, 
but it's way more good than bad. Oh. I, I loved everything that happened. Mm-hmm. You know, just you always were at the football games and never had to buy a ticket because you were performing always at the pep rallies, you know, so it's like you always had a front row view of everything that goes along with high school life because you were involved in it. Yeah, in my whole life, I've needed an audience, something about my personality. I need an audience. So marching band gave me an audience the same way this Zoom series is giving me an audience. <laughs> I, this, I just, I'm just restless for some reason, unless I have an audience. So <laughs> thank goodness CTMB was there to help help us all develop it in, in different ways. Mm-hmm, absolutely. <laughs> Let me jump forward into your kind of your professional work now. Um, and I just want to tease out this world schooling thing one more, just, just in case I have parents that are listening. What's a good way to start researching or, you know, planning for that? If, if a family is even considering that as a, a long-term commitment or if they might just want to do it a year, uh, what are some preliminary things to think about uh, as families just consider that as an option for themselves? So honestly, the first thing to do is to understand that you have to finance this experience and understanding how will I, one, save enough money to get started, but then two, how will I sustain my lifestyle once we start world schooling? Because you think about what it just takes to plan for a regular family vacation. You have to think about, well, how are we going to get there? Where are we going to stay? What are we going to eat? And you're just planning for a week or two. Well, families who are world schooling, they are doing this for, you know, most of them, a minimum of a year. And so just understanding the financial component and then also thinking about what is this going to do for our family structure? And so the advantages of world schooling definitely is that you're with your family, you're able to connect with your children, you're able to expose them to other cultures. The downside of it is, is that you're with your family. 24-7. (laughs) And so a lot of the parents said like that was just the hard part was you don't really have a break from your kids because you're no longer living around your support system. And and we noticed for the kids, especially those who were older, they were away from their friend group. And so that was a challenge for them. So really thinking about like the dynamics of your family and can you sustain that, that momentum and that togetherness for an extended extended period of time. And then finally, looking to see what countries are best for your family and looking to see what is the like the societal uh, landscape at the time. Mm-hmm. How are you going to address like health and wellness, doctor's visits and you know, dentists, yeah. some of those things that come up, you have to be very strategic in planning for living abroad. And so I would encourage families if they're interested to start following other families on social media look at some of the websites that are dedicated to world schooling, just so that you're prepared, that you're not just jumping into it blindly. I I did have one family in my study that said, okay, this is where we want to go. Let's just go and do it. But they were kind of figuring it out as they went along and they had younger children. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't have as much of a heavy lift because their girls were young. But if you do have children who are, you know, of school age, upper elementary, middle school, really want to think about how are you going to instruct them while you're traveling internationally and then just the finance and the safety piece. What do you think might be the age, the optimum age when, even though there's probably no perfect solution, every family would be different. Because what once kids turn into teenagers, they start having a lot of independent thinking in their own opinions. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that that might introduce a new challenge to the whole. Because at, at the toddler phase, whatever we, if I say le- we're going left, everybody just goes <laughs> everybody left. Everybody just turns left. <laughs> yeah, there's no uh, uh, there's no opportunity for an opinion from uh, from a toddler. So what what might what are some of the ages that seem to be the best fit for this kind of um, educational path? So I would definitely say. Um, It's two different groups. So the elementary group, because it is easier for parents to teach content at that level, most parents are comfortable teaching, you know, first, second, third grade, reading, writing, math. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they don't miss as much developmentally at that point, um, as long as the parent is comfortable with it. And then for the middle schoolers, middle school are, they're able to understand what's going on in the community that they're visiting and they have a different appreciation for it. And so when they're too young, they might miss out on some of those cultural components. But when they're in middle school, they can pick up on the language. They can start communicating with other people. They can start reading the map of where they are to understand, oh, okay, we need to take the subway to get to this point. Let me see which train we need to get on. So when middle schoolers, they can kind of help navigate the experience as well. 
and they'll retain it more. And so I would hate for, you know, someone to take their toddler and then when that toddler becomes an adult, they're like, yeah, my parents said we went to Europe, but right. I don't recall it. Versus if you have a middle schooler, they'll be able to recall mm -hmm. this experience, you know, for many years to come. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you go, but I, I want to, there's a couple of last things I, I want to get from you. Go for it. What, what is your, without, you don't necessarily have to name your employer if that's not appropriate, but what, what is it, what kind of thing do you do professionally right now? So right now I am the national director of instruction for hashtag teach. So we are an alternative route certification program. And so essentially individuals who may not have had a degree in education, but say, hey, I want to be a teacher. We support them in that certification process. And so we work with them for the first three years in the field and showing them what does it mean to be a teacher? How do you put a lesson plan together? What does classroom management look like? How do you engage with families? How do you look at instructional data to make decisions? And so I am over our instructional unit that works with all of our coaches who then work with the teachers one-on-one. -on -one. And so we certify in multiple states across the country. And uh, I have the, the privilege of working with this team. And so it's been you know, a 21 year journey to get to this point. I was a classroom teacher for 10 years, administrator for five, uh, I've had my consulting business uh, for the last six years, worked with uh, Central Michigan University in their charter school office. And so now transitioning to hashtag teach is uh, a perfect fit because I'm able to use those experience from the first 20 years yeah. for the next 20 years of my career. You know, and I saw on your LinkedIn profile, you were also the founding principal of a, maybe a middle school? Of a high school. And so, um, yep, I was there for three years. Um, and it was a great experience because it gave me the opportunity to see what it was like to start a school from ground up. When I started, we didn't have any students, any teachers. The lease hadn't even been signed on the building. Um, and so for that first year, we ended the year with 60 students and I had a, a phenomenal staff to work with those 60, ninth and 10th grade. And then one of our funders said to us, if you wanna keep the doors open for next year, you need at least 200 kids. And so my team and I literally worked 24 seven from June until that next count day, which was in September to enroll kids. And we went from 60 children to 350 within a matter, yes, within a matter of months. And so I was there for the first three years. Um, it was a great journey. And then, you know, another administrator came on board and, and uh, continued. But at that point, what was really eye-opening for me and more so for my family, they could see the exhaustion of just being a startup principal. And a lot of times people don't talk about like teacher burnout and principal burnout, yeah. but it's real. And so my mother and my uh, husband sat me down and they said, you might want to consider something else because we can see the toll that it is taking on you. I couldn't see it because I was just doing the work every yeah. single day, bringing in the kids, hiring the staff, putting out fires, helping to manage behavior, curriculum and instruction. It was just everything that a principal has to do. And so once I made that transition, I was proud of where the school was when I left. Um, I was proud of the work that I had done, but I also knew that that season in my life had ended and it gave me the opportunity to then refocus because so many years it was be a good teacher, then be a department head, then be an administrator. And you're chasing what people tell you in education you should do. And that yeah. is exactly yeah. what I did. But then, you know, once I stepped away and saw that there are other ways that I can use my skill set that then opened the door for starting the consulting business and working with CMU and working with hashtag teach. And so, you know, I just always encourage people like take your skill set and what you are good at and figure out what brings you balance while still working that job. A job doesn't have to mean grueling hours and not feeling, you know, valued or appreciated or feeling like you always have to do something mm -hmm. in order to get that value and appreciation. Now I always tell people, I don't need another office. I don't need a title. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be the person leading the school assemblies. I'm okay with being in the background and being the support and now helping to lead an organization that's preparing that next level of, of leaders in this space of education. 
Yeah, because in this conversation with you, I, I get the sense that you're an achiever, right? So if, if there's a framework and some benchmarks and milestones and there's a protocol, like you'll, you'll meet the milestones. You'll, you'll just, you'll, and, and that could, you could just take that and apply that in a bunch of different places. But that doesn't necessarily you doing the most satisfying work and the work that's going to make you the happiest. All right, man, last thing I want to hear from you. Uh, if out of all the things that you're an expert in, and you're expert in a lot of things, you know, it's, it's been a delight to hear, you know, a sprinkling of all of them. If you were to give an expert talk, you know, one of these TED talks, 15 minutes, you know, keynote delivered by you, like what, what will be the topic or the thing uh, that you will really want to bring to the world in terms of a, a specific a specific insight that you have that that's worth sharing uh, broadly? That is a really great question. Um, if I were to do a TED Talk, it would really be about how to intentionally parent your children. Um, and as an educator, I see it from both lenses. I see the child who showed up in my classroom broken. I saw the child who showed up hungry. I saw the child who couldn't focus. And in education, we call it Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If the basic needs have not been met, the child cannot flourish in an academic setting. And so I've taken children to the grocery store so that they can have groceries. I've kept extra groceries in my cabinet just so that my kids can eat. I've gone and to thrift stores to buy uniform pants for children just to make sure they would have it. Health and hygiene supplies. And so I see what can happen when the basic needs of a child is not met. But then I see the opposite of people who've poured into their children, who've exposed their children, who love on them, who have those positive affirmations for them, I see the difference in the trajectory of that child. But as an educator, it's your responsibility to love and educate both children equally. And sometimes you feel like you have to pour more into the child who needs you, but you also can't forget to pour into the child that has everything at their disposal because both of them our value and deserve an equal education. And so that is what I would share in my TED Talk is that I see it as an educator and I see it as a mother. I only get one chance to get it right with the two that I have at home. Mm -hmm. And I'm blessed to have a life partner and to have a husband and father in the household that can teach them the same way. Um, and so just understanding that, you know, parenting is not a handbook that is there. No, no. Uh, there are, you know, there are TED Talks and there are websites and, you know, there are little TikTok trends that you can follow that might help or, you know, Instagram posts that might give you pointers, but there's no true guide, but you have to follow what you want and what your desire is. Because at the heart of every parent, every parent wants what's best for their child. They may not to be able be able to provide it in the same manner, but everybody wants what's best for their child. And so that is what I would impart into individuals. It's just how do we collectively mold and shape these individuals to give them the best future possible. All right. Megan, this has been absolutely fa fascinating. Uh, so thank you so much for, for taking time to meet with me today. Uh, I want to say to our viewers, uh, if you could like this video and subscribe to our channel, we look forward to bringing you uh, more cool interviews. Uh, we thank you so much for your participation. Uh, and thank you. Uh, this, is, this has been fascinating. So I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure.